morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Susan McKenzie, and this is an Insight Conversation hosted by the Emergency Services Foundation. It will be recorded and available um, at a later date. ESF's focus is on uh, improving mental health and wellbeing outcomes for people right across the Victorian emergency services sector. Uh, that's all the 14 agencies we work with in Victoria. And here we are again in lockdown in Victoria. In these unbelievable times and through the wonders of technology, we're all joining this discussion from many different areas of our great land. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're on, and for me that's the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation here on the Mornington Peninsula. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging as we discuss this topic of how COVID has impacted on frontline workers. To do that, we're joined by uh, Professor Russell Roberts, who's in a very snowy orange at the moment. And if you look closely at the background, you can see just how much snow he has. And he's told us that he can hear the big tree next to his house creaking. So we hope it doesn't fall on him um, as he's doing this presentation. We've also got Dr. Stacey Jenkins, and she's in Wagga Wagga. And we've got Associate Professor Larissa Bambury, um, who is in Albury. And they're all, um, all members of the Charles Sturt University um, work, Workplace Wellness Research Unit, uh, which offers a comprehensive suite of expertise in research, education, policy advice, and effective interventions designed to enhance the wellness and productivity of organisations. Um, in this case, they're talking to us about the piece of research that they've done, which was uh, federally funded earlier on this year. Professor Roberts was the chief investigator who oversaw the project. He's also one of the facilitators of ESF's Leading for Better Mental Health program. So some of you may have met him uh, that way. Um, Associate Professor Bambury took primary responsibility for coding and analysing the, the qualitative data, uh, qua, uh, qualitative data um, collected uh, via the survey instrument. And Dr Jenkins played a key role in designing that and she also aided in the data analysis. So we're going to um, run this conversation today by me asking a series of questions, but they're going to be supported by um, some slides as well to, to help explain um, bits and pieces. So welcome, Russell, Stacey and Larissa from all corners of, of uh, New South Wales, basically. Um, let, me, let me begin with you, Russell. How did this project come about? Um, you know, Charles Sturt Uni's got a history of supporting regional communities and supporting workers uh, uh, out there in the field and connecting to industry, particularly in social and human services. <clears throat> and so, for example, with the bushfires, uh, we opened up our campuses and the, the meals and the accommodation to the people who are fighting the bushfires. And in this case, the university actually put some money available to do some research into the impacts of COVID in the community. And so this is one of the CSU's contributions of uh, a funded research uh, for, for the benefit of the community to look at the impacts of COVID. There were about eight different projects and ours focused on the mental health of people in frontline services. Okay, good. Um, so that sort of answers my question why CSU did this study because it was federally funded, wasn't it? Uh, well, the or, university is fed, no, the university is federally funded, but it was actually using the university's own funds. So it's the okay. university's commitment to social good. Um, we have a very strong social arm, and uh, so it was around that. Um, and why us? I guess why why this uh, team? Uh, I think the workforce wellness team. It really reason we were selected amongst uh, you know all there was probably about eighty uh, applications, and we were one of the successful eight. Uh, was because we have the balance to really look into this. We've got psychologists, we've got specialists in HR, uh, we've got specialists in communications, specialists in uh, relationships and in management and statistics, all in the one team focusing at workforce wellbeing. So we can come at this from a variety of angles and bring a multidisciplinary <coughs> uh, understanding of that. And I, and I think we'll uh, display some of that uh, today. Okay, great. 
So tell us about the sample that was used. Um, I can see on the slide there you've got paramedicine, Australian, New South Wales ambulance, etc. Tell us about the sample in the study. Yeah, well, we reached out to a number of people that we've worked with before, like New South Wales Ambulance and the Public Service Association uh, and Police and the Western District for Health. <laughs> and the, But we wanted to broaden this a little bit more because really the key question was, you know, when we have a crisis like a pandemic or a bushfire or a flood, um, society's got to keep going. And one of the key aspects of that are the essential frontline services. So we thought, this is such an important thing in terms of keeping the community going. So we wanted to have a look at sort of how to understand that better and how to support and do it better in the future. So that's where really the, the basis and the genesis of this study. And you were in Victoria, obviously. So which Victorian agencies were involved? Um, in Victoria, the agencies involved through the Police Federation of Australia were uh, Victorian police and uh, through the Australi Australasian College of Paramedicine would be the uh, New South, uh, the Victorian uh, Paramedics or Ambulance Service. Okay, okay. And um, so tell us now, what was the purpose of the, re you know, the actual objectives of the study? Well, when we look at, um, at, at the mental health, and I'll just sort of go through the, the a bit of the project snapshot. When we look at uh, what we're asking for essential services workers, they're already under a fair bit of stress. Um, so the purpose of the study was to see, well, when COVID came along, um, there were so many different factors that we'll delve into later, but you're saying, well, what impact is this having on their family life, their stress, and also most particularly on their mental health? Because if we can understand that better, we can really help agencies to better support uh, the mental health of their essential staff and, and and make the service and the individuals in it more resilient in order to be able to uh, respond and keep the community ticking over in times of crisis. You know, we've got the pandemic, but as I said, you know, we've also had the floods and the fires and in New South Wales now we've got a mouse plague, so we seem to get everything. <laughs> yeah, I heard that's coming to Victoria very soon. <laughs> oh, um, hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> So um, just before we move on, you've talked about police and ambulance um, in Victoria being involved in this study. I'm assuming that the findings of the study, though, could be translated to any of our agencies. Um, you know, I think uh, there were a lot of the findings. So we looked at uh, child protection workers, community health nurses, police and ambulance and there was a lot of consistency. So I think anyone who's providing frontline service delivery, and we've also looked at research from overseas and in Australia of other frontline services and compared our data with their data. And there's a lot of key themes that would apply, you know, right through to, you know, Red Cross, Surf Life Saving, um, you know, Salvos, anyone who's in a frontline, um, you know, fireys, anyone who's in that frontline response category. Okay. So, um can you tell us about the questions that you were looking for responses to? Um, I think this is, uh, we're going to hand over to Stacey, I think. <clears throat> sure, that's fine. I think um, in that regard, sorry, um, Susan, and thanks, Russell, um, and hi to everyone. In regards to the questions we were seeking responses to, it sort of differed in regards to, uh, well, we wanted to look at um, mental health, organisational concerns, workplace engagement as well. So there were a range of areas that we looked at. And also, too, with that, we then um, we used, we used a number of validated scales as well. So we were looking at anxiety, depression in the workplace, and so there was a mixture of ones so that we had a holistic understanding of workplace impacts, but also the impacts on the family for those who were providing that emergency and frontline service as well. Yeah, a lot of, not much work actually looks at the family and the impacts no. of the family. So, so that will be very interesting. So um, how was the data collected, Stacey? Yeah, sure. So, Ross, will just go to those next slides. So, um, this is a bit of a table. I mean, it's a bit detailed there, so I apologise if you can't see the detail. But 
basically what we did was, as with any good research project, we went through an ethics process. Uh, we had a we sought commitment from partners and we sought to engage with them to design the survey and design the questions and we sought feedback from them so that it wasn't just coming from our perspective and what we thought might be important, but we engaged with the partners we identified before and sought their feedback. Then from there, uh, we, distrib we distributed the questionnaires in September last year. Um, and we asked them to help with that and broadcasting that. And we did that via an online survey via Qualtrics using that survey. And we did that over, you know, uh, two stages. Well, there was two reminders basically. So we sent it out in September and then we sent out another reminder in uh, mid-October and then we closed the survey at the end of October. And so, um, yeah, that's, I hope that answered your question, Susan. Yeah, it did. And I actually, um I, I should have asked in a different sequence, I suppose, but why why the particular questions that you asked? You know, what, what was behind those? Well, I think, um, and Russell or Larissa, feel free to jump in, but I think in that vein it was the sense that um, it was more about I think we identified that industry as a whole and the frontline emergency services, they were being exposed to so much. I mean, they were that first point of contact. We identified uh, like through media and just through our own contacts and because we teach into paramedicine and the police as well, we were aware through our stakeholders of the impact this was having as well. So there was that sense of being aware that they were facing a large amount of stress um, on so many angles. It was just so holistic for them. And so it was from, you know, the community, they were facing issues that otherwise they wouldn't usually do in their usual, you know, work. So that that sort of was why we did it the way we did it. And I might jump in here too, uh, Stacey. I mean, the other way, I have a little bit of ad for the group because we'd love to work with more people in Victoria because, uh, uh, you know, we are committed to public service. But we work in partnerships. So on one hand, we came in with scientifically validated questions, which you'll see the reason why we did this later, around depression and stress and anxiety and workplace burnout and workplace engagement. But on the other hand, we worked with our partners closely and said, this is what we're looking at. But what about you? What's important to you? So it's a real partnership. So the reason we asked some of the questions were because uh, our partner said, this is important to us. And that's a really key part for us that we work in partnership. And you might have noticed Stacey mentioned when we had our first draft of findings, we went back to the partners and spent a day saying, well, let's work through this. What what sense do you make, a, make out of this um, before we produce the final report? And the other thing, and I'll throw to Larissa, <clears throat> In a way, when we think about workforce wellness, um, we think about the different zo um, zones of that. So, you know, an individual, so we looked at individual factors, um, but we also look at the nature of the work, but we also look at the nature of the organisation and how they interact. So that mm. also sort of, this this is the overarching model in the way that we think about workforce wellness. We just don't focus on the individual or the task or the organisation. It's They're all interconnected in terms of the mental health of uh, individuals. Yeah, and if I could just add in on that as well, um, this is I find this model, we found this model really helpful to us because there are a lot of organisations that do try to focus in on one aspect of wellbeing, either the individual and looking at the resilience of the individual and how can we build resilience in our, you know, our frontline workers particularly. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the tasks about how um, the, the frontline jobs are inherently more exposed to trauma and and vicarious trauma as well and so the, there's the focus tends to be on those two aspects uh, and how they intersect but we emphasize that it, it really has to actually uh, to um, also incorporate how the organization supports and responds to those issues and, and I think the thing that COVID has really shown us is the external environment and that's the the pestle that, that Russell's got on the on the outer group which is actually the um uh, remind me if I miss any of the things here. It's the political, economic, social, technological and legal frameworks that actually sort of uh, underpin all of the, the environment in which people work. And what we saw with COVID was, of course, that changed rapidly, especially for police who are out on the front line. They were changing the legislation. They were changing the laws. They were enforcing borders that hadn't been enforced before between states it was a really it was a really rapidly changing environment and and frontline workers bore the brunt of that and it impacted much more broadly on them than than in the past 
Yeah. So I just want to say that's our underpinning thinking about how uh, our model that underpins how we think about well-being. And, and I think this is very important, Susan, because if a lot of studies just focus on the individual, and yeah. then, but what happens is they blame the individual, say, oh, it's all your fault, you need to toughen yeah. up, take a spoon, teaspoon of concrete. But yeah. and other studies just focus on the trauma exposure and just yeah. say, yeah, it's vicarious trauma. But in the reality, all all of these factors are important and they all interact with one another, which we'll talk about with our research later. And so yeah. what we want to do is look at the entire picture because that's the only way you get the, the true picture of what's going on and the true picture of how we can support our frontline workers. Just before we go on, I forgot to mention to people on the right side of your screen is a Q&A button. If you've got a question there, um, please, please post it and we will get to that. Um, so, Stacey, you've talked about how the data was collected. Over what period was that? So that was in relation to COVID. So you said September, October last year. Yes, correct, Susan. Yes. Okay. So, Larissa, tell us, what did the study reveal? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, so I'll start with um, actually the some of the more qualitative uh, factors that we found. And they, they also, our qualitative factors also link back to the model that we've just been discussing. Um, and as I said before, one of the key things that we identified was that rapidly changing environment. And so we saw that um, what came out, particularly in the police cohort, was the, the learning curve around new principles of infection control, of using hand sanitizer, of actually having to deal with social distancing and health security. These were all new things where nurses and paramedics actually had some exposure to these concepts before. For some groups like, like policing, uh, these were new things that they had to incorporate. And for paramedics, medis, medics, it meant that they actually had to change the way that they worked with people on the on the front line uh, in order to actually use the PPE and, and take better care of that sort of social distancing issue. So, uh, we saw that um, rapidly changing environment really sort of, uh, these are all factors that were identified as the major stresses that the individuals felt. So we asked a specific question said, that asked, uh, what were the key things that created the stress for you? So we measured their stress and we measured their uh, engagement in employment, which Stacey will talk about in a minute. But when we came to um, actually trying to understand what were the things that actually contributed most to the stresses, these were the things that they identified. So the rapidly changing environment, the fact that they actually had more jobs added to their roles, they had to go out and be in the public a bit more, uh, the challenge of enforcing these rapidly changing regulations, uh, the fact they had to deal with curfews, lockdowns, hotel quarantines, border controls. They had to enforce public safety standards. And on top of that, they were the highly visible arms of government that were out in the public at a time when everybody else was closed down. So that made them really visible, made them, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but I saw every time I turned on the news there would be a... Uh, there'd be images of police walking around in, and being out with their masks on and, and being on the front line like that. So made them much more visible, which actually ended up making them a target for some, some of the complaints about how the process was being implemented. So this was a quote that we got in one of the qualitative uh, sections that was very much expressed that uh, this one actually came from a police person uh, who was actually required to... Uh, escort buses between hospitals and hotels and they said they, they didn't actually have any powers officially under the legislation to do anything if anyone tried to stop them. And they sort of advised that if somebody tried to get off the bus, we had to have a persuasive conversation with that person because they had no official powers. So these are the sort of things that added incredible levels of stress to the way uh, people were working at the time. Um, and if we jump to the next slide, Russell. So that in itself added extra load to both the tasks and the uh, the the nature of the work, if you like, and the environment. And then on top of that, we had factors that led to their challenges to their actual individual resilience. So there were some some key stresses that they were worried about in terms of how to actually manage and cope. Uh, one was they were scared of actually spreading COVID to their family, to the community. Interestingly, there was slightly less fear of actually catching it themselves. They were more worried for others. They were worried for their colleagues. They were worried for uh, community members, et cetera, and passing it on to family. 
But on top of that level of stress about those issues and the PPE issues, of course, they were they were quite stressful initially. They actually found they had less um, outlet for actually de-stressing. So they weren't able to go and do their gym classes, yoga exercises, get out there and really burn off the off the stress. Um, nor could they actually go to family, extended family events, etc. Or nor could they just go to the pub with a mate and debrief, etc. So a lot of those sort of outlets for de-stressing, the social connections, the family support, the exercise programs were also a problem for them. So overall, this actually exacerbated their uh, levels of fatigue and burnout over the period of the of the lockdowns and over the highest peak period of the of the um, uh, the pandemic itself. Um, and just one more thing, if we can move to the next slide, please. Just before Russell. you do that, Larissa, with the family, mm. did you actually speak to family members or as part of this study? No, that was prim that, that data primarily came from the question, what were the factors that gave you the most stress during this the COVID period? So that they identified in writing that they actually felt stressed because they couldn't actually get rid of the stress, you know, that it built up and it led to a, there were lots of, uh, uh, we've done a, a word cloud, if you like, that sort of emphasises all of the different words that people really repeated a lot and burnout was a massive one and fatigue and work and workload. Those ones uh, really, really sort of came out in, in very clear sense in terms of the qualitative experience. Uh, I guess the other thing that we wanted to talk about was the um, the key stresses that were in the job. So as I said before, there's that increased interaction with the public, changing nature of their interactions with the public and the changing um, tasks. So people being sent to borders, people being required to do slightly different roles or different added extra roles. Plus there was work intensification. For some that was around keeping their work sites clean and, and disinfecting every time they sat down in a new desk, etc. Uh, there was also work intensification about, for, some, for many people, it was moving to online, you know, actually using Zoom and having to learn rapidly how to actually interact with people and understand what's going on online. So those were factors that actually increased stresses within the nature of the job as well. And Larissa, one of the ones with the changes in the nature of interactions, I mean, some of the uh, anecdotal reports from police were that uh, you know asking people to move on from beaches or park mm. benches just so much aggro you know that people mm. would get like uh, resistance as, to the extent of sometimes spitting on them you know in the middle mm. of a, in the middle of a pandemic and so the police are having to confront this and they're never really sure how a community members going to respond whether they say oh okay no worries or whether they they respond aggressively and you know um mm -hmm. you know violently so it's just a tremendous uh, stress of that uncertainty of that that changing nature with their with the public mm -hmm. i remember during the summer i was down at the beach with my dog you know and he was at an off lead area and he was running around the beach in my hour of exercise and I sat on the beach while he was having a swim and a run around with the other dogs and the police came and told me I couldn't sit down. You know, <laughs> it's not exercising if you're sitting down. <laughs> really, that's right, while well, I was waiting for the dog. That's right. But, oh, dear. I mean, it, it, was, it, it felt very confrontational. Mm, yeah. mm, indeed, yeah. So all of these factors actually came out as well in the uh, the measurements that we um, uh, made as well. And I think Stacey was going to have a little talk us through some of the, the scales and the measures and uh, how they impact were impacted by the process. <laughs> yeah, sorry, or Russell, were you happy to jump in with those ones? Sorry. Actually, I, I might come in with the uh, psychometrics, given the, my psychology background. <clears throat> sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so Larissa's talked about the qualitative. So when we talk, you know, ask people questions and people just spontaneously come out with what's in the front of their mind and is what most concern. In this case, we use some measures, uh, standardised psychometric measures of depression. Um, and because we can do that, uh, we can get measure of our respondents, which are in orange down there, versus the general population and general frontline workers. And this is a study from Norway of public servants who are on, in the front line. Um, and you have a look at this, and this is quite frankly alarming. The two percent; these are these these little people represent a percentage. So, in the general population on this PHQ nine, we, the average is 
about 2% of the population have severe depression. Frontline workers, as we know, because of the nature of the work and the stress and the amount of workload, are higher. In COVID, they're higher again. Our respondents, being police and ambulance and child protection workers, are through the roof. This is mm. nine times the level of the general population. So we were expecting to see mental health impacts. We were not expecting to see such devastating mental health impacts. I actually asked a statistician to go back twice and check this because I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Um, and you look at this the general population, there's a health pre-COVID and they're the mean score, so the average score on this scale. And you can see at once again, our sample is probably three times higher than average on uh, standardised measure of depression, which we've compared in Australia and overseas. This is Australian data. Um, <clears throat> likewise, for anxiety, we use the uh, generalised anxiety uh, uh, score uh, for anxiety, the GAD7. And once again, we can see for our sample, um, I think it was about five times the general population rate. Um, frontline workers' anxiety was right up there and not surprising really, because we've got a raging pandemic, you know, infectious disease out there. But our respondents were even more. I think some of the reason was that most frontline workers were like in hospitals and in service centres. Our police and, and ambulance are going into unknown, uncontrolled environments. Um, whereas if you're in a hospital or a service centre, you've got control and you understand infection control. And quite frankly, hospital workers are used to infection control. We've had about five or six, five pandemics before, so that we do infection control well. I came out of a hospital syst uh, system and we did all of these scenario testing and, and et cetera. But once again, see how much higher our uh, people in our study were uh, than the general population. So that's the general measures of individual um, uh, depression and anxiety. But when the measure of burnout, workplace burnout, and I've just looked at two of these, and one of them is emotional exhaustion. And that's just when you're tired and fatigued and at the end of your rope. And you notice pre-COVID frontline workers, it's not good, it's quite high. Um, but uh, for general and frontline, we're up to sort of mid 30%. But for our respondents, that's over 50% are in the red zone. That means mm. there are high levels of emotional exhaustion. They are half of the staff are running on empty. And this is alarming and it's concerning in terms of, you know, how long can we ask our frontline workers to keep going on this? The other uh, aspect is, so sorry, just, Susan. Before yeah. you go um, forward there, just so I'm clear, so the data on pre-COVID frontline workers, where did you get that from? Uh, that's from a study from uh, um, uh, Johnson. Uh, it's it's for Norwegian workers, so they're frontline workers in in Norway. And what um, about the COVID nineteen frontline workers? Where's that from? Sorry, I've got that around the wrong way. So this is a study uh, Australian frontline workers by uh, Dobson is a study of pre COVID the the levels of emotional exhaustion were there. The COVID nineteen frontline workers is Johnson, which is a Norwegian it's not. study of frontline workers, which includes health staff, but also, uh, you know, uh, public admin staff and vaccination centres and, you know, uh, government centres that have direct frontline contact uh, with the um, uh, with with the public, uh, whereas our respondents have, uh, you know, the ambulance and police and child protection workers as well. So the COVID frontline workers were mm -hmm. more in the health environment? Yes. Okay. Yeah, health and public service, frontline. Yeah. Uh, people in COVID are having direct physical contact, uh, you know, with social distancing, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, cynicism is a, another thing where they just, people start to lose, um, uh, they, they lose empathy. They start to think, you know, you're just a trouble. So when they're in contact with the community members, it's like, you're just a nuisance or you're a trouble. Why are you making my life hard? Why am I doing this? So just getting emotionally hardened and forgetting that it's a person on the other side that you're working with um, and that, um, uh, you know, that, that another measure of burnout, which once again is, you know, uh, three times the level of pre-COVID frontline workers. Um, uh, and once again, you know, it's really um, uh, alarming. Uh, I mean, as I said before, it's, I'm really concerned that a lot of staff, it's not all, but a lot of staff are, all, are running on empty. They're, they're at the end of their rope. And in fact, that's one of the questions in the study. 
Um, yeah, actually, so, Russ, can I jump in there? Sorry, just to add course. to that sort of thing, like when you were talking about that burnout and that cynicism, it related also to we included a scale regarding organisational citizenship behaviour and intention to quit. So about how, how much you know, an individual is willing to give to their organisation and we found that their levels, like they felt they were still giving, but they were exhausted as Russell's highlighted and with that it then came through in their intention to quit, which when we were speaking with the Police Services uh, Federation specifically, they were so alarmed by the statistics because they said this is a, a workforce that usually doesn't show a high turnover rate, but the intention was there that staff, one third of their staff or their work of their members was was showing that they were actively considering alternative employment. So, mm -hmm. um, and about five percent were definitely looking to quit. So for them, that's forty percent of their overall workforce had intentions of potentially or actively seeking or actually looking to quit. Which you can imagine, if we lost forty percent of the, our police force, yeah. we would in dire, dire trouble. Yes. And I think so one of the difference between agencies. Um, we we, oh, we looked at that a, a, a little bit, and yes, there was, um, and not always in the direction that you expected. Um, mm -hmm. It seems as though child protection, strangely enough, had, were. Um, so we still have to unpack that. We, we, we're still working on it and still trying to make sense of it and doing some structural equation modelling. But for example, child, we were very surprised that child protection uh, people were had sort of the highest levels of emotional burnout. Um, and uh, my, uh, we're looking at the data more, but I think a lot of that was that um, and so many people were redeployed. Um, mm. And so working from home. So that means case workers who have to go out to people's homes, once again, an uncontrolled environment, um, they had to do a lot more work because a lot mm. more uh, child protection workers were allowed to work from home and do sort of paperwork, et cetera. The other thing that we found is that um, they were they um, child protection is a particular sort of work, and uh, that had us bringing uh, child abuse, child neglect issues back to your own home and your own family. Mm. Uh, working from home caused a lot of stress. Before you could have this barrier like this is all at work, and when I leave work and and commute. I leave that behind. So there's work and there's home. This COVID has meant there's been a merge of work and home. And so some of those mental health protective mechanisms people put in spontaneously have been dismantled. And so mm. uh, that's, yeah, uh, Larissa, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to add in mm. on there. I, I, I've done some work with some of the social workers before, and I think their workloads were excessively high before COVID. So there's a level of we were exhausted to start with and then we were asked to do more. Uh, and also the social nature of their jobs means that usually if they're in the workplace, they can debrief with each other. And when they're at home, they've got no one to debrief with except their family and they don't want to tell their family about some of the horror stories they hear and see. So they don't... Mm have any outlet like that yeah. and I, I was just also going to add in very quickly on the um on the community nurses that we had uh in the in the cohort their cohort was particularly interesting too because again you'd think uh nursing staff in particular have a very good personal efficacy a, a very good um belief that what they're doing is making a difference and having an impact and amongst this group during covid that was actually significantly less um than uh, than than it normally was amongst health workers. So I, I think that they felt that they weren't getting and having as much impact. They weren't doing their job as well as they would like to. Those stresses, etc., all started to build up. So I, that was quite a, a very distinct story in in the in the uh, community health nurses. And Stacey, did you want to add something about the particular cohort too? <laughs> Oh, no, I, I think when, you know, as you were talking, what resonated with me as well was that sense that um, what we found as well, one of the biggest um, compounding factors was the inability for the staff to take leave. So um, I'm not sure if we mentioned that as much, but um, I just felt that that came across very heavily, that, uh, that sense of, you know, just frustration that there was just that blanket, nobody could take leave, they had to do overtime. Um, they were already exhausted. So, you know, all these compounding factors, you can understand why our levels are demonstrating what they were in regards to burnout, exhaustion, which, intention. Which is the exact opposite to friends of mine who work in banking and who have been forced to take all yeah. their leave at times when, you know, 
they're on leave at the moment when they're in lockdown. They're sitting at home in the cold saying, well, what can we do? And and I'm using <laughs> up all my long service leave and all my other leave. So it, yeah. it's, it's very different. Yeah. So you've yeah. talked so far about the broader environment, the stresses of the broader environment, individual resilience and the nature of the work. What about the organisational structures like culture and leadership? What did you ask mm -hmm. about that? Um, and, and that's a great question because I was going to reflect on what you just said before, uh, Susan, and what um, uh, Stacey and, and Larissa were talking about. You know, what made it worse uh, about the inability to take leave or have flexible working arrangements is that the organisations up front said, listen, we'll support you, we'll give you leave, we'll be flexible, etc. But the reality was so many people got redeployed because of uh, personal vulnerability like poor health or uh, family members that they needed to support that, in fact, that wasn't available. So don't promise me more flexible work arrangements. Don't promise me extra leave. And the reality is I don't get any of that. I've got to work harder. So that's a sort of a double whammy. Um, so we did look at some of those things as well. So I'll jump down to that. Um, we did ask about, you know, organisational communication. Um, you know, what was, how much was, how much communication? What was the best form of communication? Did you get practical help? Did you get practical did you get the equipment that you needed to do your job? Uh, were you satisfied with the communication? And there was a, a lot about that, which we'll unpack, or we'll maybe, uh, maybe now that we'll this jump was. To that now. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll jump to it now then. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, predictors of burnout, uh, th and this is strange. There's a big other, and this is, uh, you know, this other of some things, and I'll jump back to that. The other things that, you know, it could be like someone has poor health. It could be that someone's in financial, you know, running close to the bone financially. It could be that they, um, you know, the other families lost their, members lost their job, or they have, they're looking after aged parents. So that, that predicts stress, of course. Um, and we did ask about that. But the other thing is, in predicting burnout, practical support predicted 11% of burnout. So if we're trying to say, well, what's the causes of burnout? The lack of practical support, like give me my PPE, tell me mm. what I need to do, give me the, the tools to do my job. The other one which came up a lot was consultation, like talk to us, you know, um, there was a feeling for some because of the lockdown, a lot of the senior management were in lockdown in their offices. And they said, but you don't know what it's like on the front line. You know, you need to get out here and talk to us and get the reality on the ground. And and so that was that came through a lot. The, and Larissa was talking about this before. Workload actually was a major thing. Most people in most organisations said their workload is a bit more than normal. That's quite frank. That Frankly, that's, that's consistent with all of the Australian workforce. There's about 4.6 hours of unpaid work per week across the Australian workforce. But it went up another 10%. So now they're working another five or six hours additional a week. So workload and the complexity of the workload and the demands of the workload was one of the major predictors of burnout, the biggest single predictor of burnout. Um, the other one is practical guidance. And I know this is hard, but it's like, tell me what I need to do. Normally with police, you know, there's a new law. There might be an exposure bill for six months. And then it might be three months to operationalise it before it goes live in, you know, the local area commands. Well, here they were making a new public health order law one day and the police had to operationalise it the next day. And they go, mm -hmm. what do I do? How do I operate? And, and different local area commands had different interpretations of that. So that's a really practical guidance of what do you do next? And the other one was communication. Sometimes it was, you know, death by PowerPoint, like we're giving to you, hopefully not too much. <laughs> um, it was death by communication. So many people would go, oh, look after yourselves. Oh, I need to do this. And then one person would say, do this. And then another person would give a contradictory message. And they go, in the end, people were ignoring emails because there were so many and they were contradictory. So getting the communication right is key making sure that there's sort of one or two people who are authorised to give messages and make sure the messages are clear, crystal clear and unambiguous. So, um, you know, in your mind, when you write a message, it's clear, but you need to think about well, what's the person on the front line going to make of this. So communication was a big organisational component. Over, and by management, it's like executive upper tiers of management uh, uh, comms. Can I also say, though, um, Anecdotally, and also with the data, most people were 
in all of their frontline direct managers who had to transact this. They were the buffer between them and everything that's going around and just so much, you know, people going above and beyond to look after their staff, um, which was just so encouraging. So if you were to say in one sentence what you took out of this about people leadership from this study, what would you say? Um, I would say listen and look after your staff. Listen to your staff and look after them uh, would be the one sentence. And what that is, the consultation, find out what it's like, find out what your needs are, what you need in terms of support, how's your workload going, um, you know, and then, and then do something. You know, most of leadership is turning up. So when you hear it, have a go, do something. And the most important thing, quite frankly, is to release operational capacity, like manage the workload. You know, um, you, in times of crisis, you need to mobilise to address that crisis. So you need to listen to the staff about what do you need to do? You're on the front line. Tell me what I can do to support you. That's more than a sentence, isn't it? Listen. <laughs> <laughs> listen I was going to say you have after. trouble keeping Russell to one sentence. <laughs> yeah, next, and, but uh, and we do. get the we get what you're saying absolutely. So um, that leads me on to the question of what recommendations have you made out of this study? Um, well, we're talking about. Mm. Uh, so these are some of the recommendations that have come out to our partners uh, and there's a handful of recommendations and we've talked about this before, but, you know, one of them is crystal clear communication. Uh, you, organisations need to have a crisis communication plan, like have only authorised people sending, sending out emails, not a, not 20 emails a day that will that people just want and they say I don't I don't open them anymore because there's so many about COVID saying look after yourself and stretch like just have clear operational protocols tell me what I need to do also uh, the communication about the leave and flexible work options I'll let Stacey um, and the recognition and recognition starts by meaningful consultation getting out there and saying how are you going what are your challenges <clears throat> and connecting with the on-the-ground staff. And I don't know which jurisdiction this was, but someone had a pay freeze and wage cuts. And you know, when workload's going up and you're asking a lot more from your staff, that is a big no-no. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other aspect is uh, practical support. You know, a, a lot of organisations, they just didn't give people enough PPE or they didn't trust them to use it appropriately. They didn't think about redeploying staff. Some of the central office staff Get out there on the ground and get your hands dirty again and help out the front line um, and think about ways of releasing additional operational capacity. Are there other things that you can delay for a while to respond to the crisis? People were like like my trees in the yard <clears throat> and I might they were they were uh, bending Sorry. under the burden and the weight of the workload. I just have to be a bit gratuitous here and just share with everyone the snow and my outside my office. So this is this is what I'm looking at right now, snowing here in Orange, and those limbs are bending and some of them breaking. That's why I can't get out at home under the weight of the additional snow. Well, that's the same for staff, you know. Um, they, uh, they're they bending under the weight of the additional work. So you need to release additional operational capacity so that they can survive. Um, <clears throat> the team climate, and Larissa talked about that, recognise the social components of work, the need to debrief, uh, and also to frame the meaning. We did find for a lot that, in fact, what the personal efficacy and professional accomplishment actually went up. Because whilst it's a hard work and whilst I'm getting burnt out, this is valuable. The community is really behind there. Uh, Stacey and Larissa, I might get you to add any narrative to the recommendations. Sure, Russell. I think you've summed it up really nicely, though, so I won't go on too much. I was just probably going back to the leave and the flexible work options in that sense, too. From We did get conflicting messages sometimes between different cohorts when you were mentioning, Susan, were there differences between agencies? Sometimes between agencies, like, for example, with police, like those who were able to work from home and those who weren't, how it was managed at the beginning and the sense that they weren't allowed to work from home, but then suddenly they were allowed to work from home. And, again, I think that goes back to Russell with, uh, a point about 
but well crisis communication plan but also you know not just communication but clear policies what happens in pandemics so really thinking about crisis management before it hits and making sure you set up those you know pol policies and procedures up front um, and that sense that also to a lot of the stress that did come for a number who were then given the option to work from home was that sense of having to homeschool and so it was just really difficult for them and they just felt so inundated with so many pressures from so many angles and felt they were failing on so many uh, and just where do I go sort of thing so there was that sense I found from what I read um, yeah some of that commentary that came through but I'll hand over to Larissa. Can I just yeah. ask on the hand pick, what does meno mean you are the meno what Oh, okay. So um, glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, we're, I'm studying Italian, uh, and so "mano" is actually the Italian word for hand, um, okay. and it's the root. It's a root word for manager, and it's also mm. the root for word for handling. So, handling a crisis situation, you know, managers. You then so it's a little mnemonic of the four, five fingers of the hand. So, <clears throat> we are the hand. Uh, we are the managers, and we're the handlers of the crisis. And actually. In fact, no matter where you are, and I'll jump to this and then we'll come back to that. <clears throat> no matter where you are, your role in your situ in, in the organisation, um, you, you, you're handling the crisis. And uh, what I want to say, and there's a whole debate about this Superman as well between us, uh, between Stacey and I. Um, this is actually a picture of me going down to do my grocery shopping when I had hair. Um, <laughs> uh, but... <clears throat> You know, uh, people are not Superman and you can only do what you can do and you can't control the world. Yesterday, I took a, a bunch of printer cartridges back to Officeworks. I did the right thing. What Officeworks do, whether they throw them in the, in the tip or landfill or whether they recycle them properly, I can't control. And that's the same for everybody. You can't control what anyone else does, but you can, can control what you do. And you can only do what you can, where you can, when you can so like if you notice uh, one of your fellow staff members struggling say how you're going is there any way i can help if you notice there's something wrong with your team talk to your manager respectfully about it if you're a manager speak to middle management about it and say we need more of this um, and that it might not happen you know nothing may come of it and you can't control what happens but you can control what you do I mean, even Babe Ruth there, he only batted at 30%. So every time he st stepped up to the plate, he only was only successful 30% of the time. He was a legend. He was a superman. But we're not superman. So you just, you know, otherwise, if we try to do too much, it's just another stress. You can only do what you can do. Um, but you can do something by, you know, well, what you can, where you can, when you can. <clears throat> So um, I'm just conscious of the time here. So, um, yeah, what's next with this? You've obviously <laughs> fed it back to the Police Federation and the paramedicine. Yeah, absolutely, Susan. So we have we ha we met with all of our partners in December and offered the initial feedback. And again, like Russell said, we sort of unpacked that initial, you know, findings and went through that with them. And what does this mean for you? This is the way we've interpreted it, you know, but what are you thinking so and then based on that we've now gone back and we're now finishing off the final reports and from that we're then going to be you know putting this out to the public via different forms of um, publications so we will be doing reports a general one and we'll also do in, uh, bespoke reports as well for individual agencies noting we're not there to name and shame any agency at all um, it's about working with the agency helping them to identify how can we improve we see this as a community um, issue and something that we want to work together um, with our partners and going, okay, how can we assist? This is what it said. Do you need us to go further? Would you like us to investigate further? Very keen to do that. Is there an aspect that you'd like us to look at? And so that's what we're starting to do with each respective partner now. So, yeah. Okay, so um, bearing in mind that in Victoria we've got 14 agencies. They've all been involved in their own way in relation to COVID here. What would be your message for the leaders at the top of those agencies, of what you took away from this? Uh, great point. Um, I think it's <laughs> the good old continuous improvement cycle is the way I like to sum it up. And um, what that means is that you need to, as we highlighted before, 
they need to think about what's important for their workforce or what makes them productive, what makes them be able to be sustainable. And with that, the only way they can identify that is to listen and connect like Russell identified. So I know it might seem as though I'm, you know, re-emphasizing what he is, but this was our key points is that sense you need to one, listen and connect. You're never going to be able to achieve change if you don't communicate or consult and work out what the issue is. Check with them, get their input, be engaged. Don't don't be, you know, you need to be on the floor. You need to be very aware of what they're facing in order would, to address it. Sorry, Stacey, yeah. I was just going to say, in the middle of a situation, this doesn't mean putting out a survey. This means no. <laughs> getting out from behind your desk and going exactly. out with the paramedics or, or going and standing on a border crossing um, for a while or, you know, doing a patrol down the beach with people mm -hmm. or in the shopping centre to understand what that feels like. That's what you mean, isn't it? 100% Susan I couldn't yeah absolutely so it's that sense that unless you're there with them and sometimes it, it they just want you to be there to listen and to see what they're being exposed to they you, they might appreciate you can't do much based on your own power of you know your own ability to as Russell said depending on what your level of authority and command is but it's that sense of being there with them and being able to appreciate what they're facing so it's that empathy that understanding which is really important so not for a photo opportunity i'm very conscious of the time there is it yeah. uh, somebody has asked us are the survey results publicly available oh, um, yeah. yeah we will have a copy uh, of the generic survey reports but once again you know we're here to help the jurisdictions not to em embarrass them so there'll be an overall summary uh, but, but it won't identify police versus ambulance versus Victoria versus New South Wales, etc. Um, and we are also producing bespoke reports to each of our partners, but that's their property. If they want to share it with their members, they can. It's not our call, but we'll share the overall one. And I, I think that will be out and online probably in, in two weeks' time, the, the so uh, summary wait, report. You could make sure you give that to us and we can link it. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's That'd be good. And somebody else has asked, um, been uh, helpful and interesting for those of us, are we able to get access to the slides or a summary of the results? Same sort of question. So we will get the summary results and we'll put them um, on our website. But a recording of the presentation today will be um, available tomorrow on ESF's website as well. So you can share it with anybody else in the organisation. Susan, and I'm, I'm, actually, just a second, I'm actually yeah. going to make sure that all the heads of agency um, get a copy to this link as well, because I think it's really important that uh, that they hear it as well. Thanks. Um, and just to also flag to uh, the listeners uh, to this and the recording that we will send the link back to everyone who participated. We will send a link and saying, the thank you for participating in our survey. Here's the link to the report. So, you know, we're not just, we're, we're feeding back to everyone who participated as well. And one other final ad, if people want to hear more about this, I understand there's a great speaker coming up at the Workplace Mental Health Symposium. Uh, <laughs> I think the chief executive of ESF is going to present on <laughs> uh, some of the work and as is Stacey. Uh, and that's in August. So, you know, please come up to the Workplace Mental Health Symposium in August on the Gold Coast. But also there'll be presentations at the R Rural Remote Mental Health Conference in November in Canberra. So if you want to hear more and discuss uh, this and other research around this area, there's great opportunities to do that. And Susan, thank you so much for inviting us. It's just such a pleasure. That, that's great. Well, look, there's no more questions there. I'll just give people a moment if they want to ask a question. Um, ESF, of course, has its own conference in Melbourne on the 6th and 7th of July, which is very soon. So we're, um, we're currently reassessing how that's going to go. Um, the, the world is very topsy-turvy. So question, not emergency services. Our contract traces became a political and media football. The effects on many were very great. Did you notice any of this in New South Wales? So she's talking to, she, the person's talking about contract traces in Victoria. And I notice you wouldn't have seen this, but in the media here this week, um, James Molino and Brett Sutton and everybody are just constantly saying what a great job the contract tracers have been doing. 
because mm -hmm. people have got no concept of what that role is. And uh, from a communications perspective, that's my background. If I was doing a communications plan on that, one of the first things I would have done is put something out to show the complexity of that job. Because nobody mm -hmm. sitting in their lounge room watching the six o'clock news has any idea of what a contract mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. So let's tell them. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's such a great point. And that's the when we said, you know, you frame the narrative. You need to tell the community and also tell your staff, you know, the complexity and how valuable that is. And, you know, um, it's very shameful how some people use uh, the frontline workers who are, you know, having a go as a mm. political football. And so that's the real important uh, importance of framing the narrative and saying, don't have a go at them. They are our heroes. Mm. Absolutely. So the, the, the contract traces weren't actually part of your study, though, were they? No. no, but certainly there was examples in our cohort of people who felt that they'd been politicised, that uh, particularly amongst the police cohort, where they felt like they were bearing the brunt of decisions that were made to shut down borders, um, and and they were basically feeling like they were the ones who were enforcing stuff that they may not have agreed with themselves, um, and they were certainly in the public eye, and there was a lot of politicisation about those border closures that, that made it really difficult for them to do the job effectively. So, yeah, uh, great sympathy and empathy for those people doing those jobs because they were tough and they were politicised and they didn't deserve that. Yeah. No. And, and I think this it. is the, the final thing is emergency frontline human services workers are trem do a tremendous work and in crisis even more so. And, and really it's the reverse, that we and their leaders should be acknowledging that for the great, the great work that they're doing. And that's probably the most important thing. People are happy to go above and beyond and work hard and even put themselves at risk of infection. But really the people in leadership have to recognise that contribution because uh, if you don't, it's a little bit disrespectful, quite frankly, because uh, mm -hmm. people will, will go above and beyond, but they want to be recognised and acknowledged for the work, the great work that they're doing. OK, we'll have to finish there. So thank you so much, Russell, Stacey and Larissa. That was a, a really interesting conversation and I'm sure the people who uh, tuned in have enjoyed it. So thank you very much and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.